This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another React Roundup. This week on our panel, we have Corey House. Hello from Kansas City. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week, we have a special guest, and that's Lucas Reyes. I, I hope I got close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got it. Uh, hello from New York City. <laughs> wow. All the way from New York City. Yes. I didn't realize how big New York City was until I went there two years ago. And I was like, holy cow, this place is nuts. It is giant. It is giant. I've been living here like for less than a year. I lived in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil before. Uh And it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. (laughs) That's wild. Well, do you want to give us a brief introduction? Let us know who you are, why you're world famous, all all that stuff. (laughs) <laughs> All right. All right. I work today as a senior uh, developer, senior front-end developer here at ZocDoc, based in New York. Before joining ZocDoc, up until like seven months ago, I worked uh, in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, in a company called B2W, which is the largest uh, e-commerce in Brazil. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the largest in Latin America, too. And uh, before that, I worked as a fun fact, I worked for more than 10 years as a professional musician, but we don't need to go that route <laughs> today. I wrote a blog post. I wrote a blog post about React patterns, simple React patterns uh, last year. It's like I always try to write a little bit about uh, things that I'm facing like every day, issues that I'm facing every day on my work. And as soon as I have some ideas in my in mine, I write blog posts to try to summarize them, make them clear. Uh, after working in, uh, I don't know, about a dozen React projects in the last years, I've seen some patterns evolving and some were more successful than others. So I decided to capture them in a, in a blog post. Uh, I think after one, two months after blog post was uh, was released. It got really big on Hacker News. Today's on first page, and people are sending me emails <laughs> up until today about it. And that's it. So you're famous. You want to come on a podcast? <laughs> I don't believe I'm famous, but I would love to be on a podcast. <laughs> awesome. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. I'm still learning React, and so I'm looking mm-hmm. at these patterns and going, "Okay, it looks like React." Uh, yeah. I'm curious how this lines up with your experience, though, Corey. Is this pretty common way to structure React? Uh, well, I actually didn't follow the context there, though. When you say, is this a common way, what was the context of the you're referring in, in to? the blog post. So the yeah, code I, I mean, and, yeah. yeah, many of the patterns that um, Lucas talked about there are very popular. Um, the one that I found most novel uh, was the... Oh, I can't remember the name that you chose for it. Let me scroll <laughs> back up um, because I, I sort of call it the it's it's a recipe. That's not the one. There we go. The container branch view pattern um, mm-hmm. is one I've seen people choose different names, and I always stumble obviously over the name to choose for it. Uh, and uh, given so here we are on a podcast. Uh, so now we get the fun challenge of describing this pattern verbally. So Lucas, do you want to describe uh, what this pattern is and when you'd want to use it? Yeah, uh, maybe let's let's uh, have one step back. Uh, one thing that sometimes people people write me is like, what do you mean by successful? So before describing the patterns, maybe we could go like, what do I mean by these are successful patterns, right? So first of all, like the, the, the projects I've been working with uh, in the last years, they, they have... Uh, they have a certain characteristic and they are, um, um, they're all long-term products, right? Uh, We have lots of different developers and different teams working these projects and these projects are all supporting big businesses. So they are making money. 
So we have three things in, uh, that uh, define this kind of pro uh, products. It's like we need a lot of maintainability since they will be around for years. We need uh, to be very, we need a lot of communication. We need to become communicative with our code because it's like lots of different developers and different teams. And they need to be reliable because we are actually supporting big business with, with this project. So this is the first definition. I want to, to make sure we are all on the same page. And the definition of successful is uh, given that scenario, Uh, a successful pattern uh, in a successful uh, piece of code is a piece of code that I believe it's fast and easy to diagnose and fix bugs. This is the first thing. Uh, second thing, it's fast and easy to add new features to this piece of code. And it's fast and easy to refactor and update dependencies, this kind of thing. So uh, given these, these definitions of successful and which type of products we're talking about, uh, that's uh, when I started looking at these patterns. So the first, uh, the first way that, that we start writing React components is what I call the mixed component, which is like you put everything in the same component. It's like uh, when you see like React docs, this is the first, uh, the first uh, way you start writing a React component. You put like a component did mount, I fetch, I have some state, I have set state everywhere. And I have my view code, which is fine. Like for simple use cases, it's fine. In my experience, in projects of these types, the use cases are never that simple when side effects are involved. Whenever you need to fetch information, we never need to, to need with like weird network uh, problems, things get slow, uh, you, have, you need to deal with errors. You're, you're, never, you're never in a situation where these uh, mixed components uh, solve things in an effective manner. So this is why the first, uh, the first uh, pattern that I believe it's, it's, it works for 95% of the time, and it's the pattern that I think that everyone should try to, to write their components is the container view. It's the first step towards the container branch view. Corey that just said. So the container view is like, first of all, separate view from business logic. Uh, we have like, usually we have, let's say uh, we have product component, right? Separate into product view and product container. The container is what fetches information, is what deal with like, am I Uh, get information from local storage? Am I uh, doing like really uh, complex state handling? Uh, and then I have the, the product view, which is separated. The importance of having this thing separate is that the view is highly composable. You can extract things from, from the view. You can make like smaller components. It's really, it's actually kind of fun to work with views in React. So you can compose them all, And it's easy that this is separated. Uh, and the container, I, I even say, like, try to put one side effect in one different container. You can have multiple containers in one co component, one that only does the fetch, one that only does the, the local storage uh, stuff, one that only goes to GraphQL, one that only sends like metrics events. You can, you can do a bunch and only compose them. So whenever there's a problem in your, in your code in the future, you can find exactly where the code is and it's not like a 200 uh, line, a thousand line component. Uh, the container branch view pattern is when you... Uh, when you put like one uh, component between your containers and your views, and this uh, branch component is the component that will select the right view uh, according to the state that the, the props that are being passed to your view. So it's, uh, it's kind of like the same uh, pattern. It's a small variation and sometimes it's very effective. So you can like reuse like loading views and error views and things like that. Um, you branch it in the middle. So I think this is the, the, the first uh, successful pattern that, that I've come across. And as I say, like this is the pattern of 
this is 95% of the code I write and 95% of the successful code I've, I've came across. I don't know if you would agree with that, Corey. Yeah, I, I've come across many of the, the same experiences there. I think that um, separation of concerns is an overarching idea that's useful all over the place. And that's largely what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. When I think about early on, uh, when any time that I teach people react, a common concern that people have is, aren't we talking about mixing concerns now that we've placed JSX in a JS file, we're effectively putting HTML with JavaScript. Um, and I think to some degree, this uh, idea of separation between container components and presentation components resolves that concern because your container becomes increasingly like a controller and MVC and your view, well, your presentation component becomes increasingly like a view in MVC. Uh, and there's a recognition then that uh, you might reuse that container, uh, potentially composing with different components. And that's where this, this branch pattern can uh, potentially become useful there. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've definitely seen uh, the same benefits that you talk about, about splitting those up. If for no other reason, then uh, I also just like being able to look at a present. So I looked at this, especially that branching view that uh, mm -hmm. Corey was talking about. And I have to say that if, if else, if else, or else if, else if, <laughs> um, if, if you have more than two forks on an if, which is the if and the else, I just get developer hives. I, I don't know how, how else to say it. It just, mm -hmm. it, it really makes me uncomfortable because it feels like, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this. And, and so I'm looking at it and thinking, okay, well, you know, couldn't you encapsulate some of this, you know, so that instead of loading or uh, error, you know, you just, you encapsulate in the view. And I know you're trying to get a separation of concerns, but it, yeah, the it thing is, seems yeah. less error prone doing it the other way to me. I understand. Like whenever, whenever we have to branch like any kind of of code, right? We need to 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 choose like where this branch is going to take place. So it's mm -hmm. it's it's a matter of like looking at the problem you have and trying to find like where is it going to be like less uh, problematic to have the this uh, branch logic. Uh, the bunch of like if else if else here and there. It's uh, uh, I think it's a JavaScript characters that we need to, to to live with and it's not very different from like a switch statement they don't they, it's like almost like syntax differences when we go to uh, powerful more powerful typed languages like reason ml and things like that we have pattern matching and it feels uh it feels better and more reliable to do those kinds of logic because the compiler helps you like uh, mm -hmm. make sure that all the states are 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 taken into account, so it feels it feels less bad to do it. But I believe that in in JavaScript we have no way of escaping ifs. We can maybe encapsulate things. Uh, we have uh, there are projects like React Loadable, for instance, that uh, it. Uh, it you pass uh, a loading component and the React load, the, the library itself understands when it needs to show the loading state or not, the loading view or not. So, of course, like when you when you start repeating uh, those patterns a lot, you can put the, the bunch of if else things on only one place and that and that will work for you. Um, in the future, and I believe this is the same thing that the this is the same kind of problems. These every time. So another another important uh, concept when working with front end is that uh, every time you're working with something that is depending on data coming from a network, you need to think of three states. You cannot at least three states. Like you have the successful state, you have the error state, and you have like I'm waiting for data state at least this three, right? So this is, uh, this branching logic will, will have to be somewhere and you need to be prepared for it. Uh, the next step on, on the patterns, uh, take that into account, is like, what if I need to reuse logic a lot among our components? 
right? This is a case that happens a lot. And in front end, in web front end, we have a lot of like uh, listeners and things like that. So uh, we have, for instance, if we're listening for a resize event, uh, and then we unsubscribe from these events on uh, component amount, things like that, we uh, quickly are like repeating ourselves uh, everywhere. So this is when uh, uh, a pattern called, there are two patterns that deal with that in React and they're very successful. Uh, the first of all is high order component, right? Higher, with a higher order component is actually, I don't like this name. This name is, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I believe. We've discussed it on the show before. Yes, yes. I, I remember like Kent saying like, it's, the, the name is like wrong. <laughs> it's not yeah. that I don't like it's wrong, but okay, it, it attracts attention to the pattern, so maybe it, it was successful. So you you feel you feel smarter by using high order anything, right? That's right. I I'm a higher like, order developer. Yes. So maybe this is part of the of the pattern success. It's simply like a function that takes at least one component as a as an argument as a parameter and returns another component. And usually it's the component that you pass enriched with some props. Mm -hmm. So it's really simple to use uh, higher order components. They are really powerful. Uh, I believe that like Redux was so, uh, is so used everywhere in, in React projects. And we're all using uh, the connect higher order component uh, everywhere and it works really well. So uh, this is actually like a way of reusing logic in different components. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, some projects, let's say we, we save a bunch of uh, user-related data in local storage or like cache some, some data on local storage and we need to access that. Uh, sometimes it's smart to just build like a high order component and reuse it in your different components throughout your whole website right. that you... So when I need to change, if I uh, need to take uh, this all this information out of local storage and let's go old school, put in cookies for whatever reason, we only change this higher order component and it updates to, to, to the whole project. So it's uh, very effective. In the last month, Another pattern is that does that has the same objective as render props uh, is getting more traction, and even the new uh, the new React React sixteen uh, they they are they have this new context API which is like uh, use render props uh, pattern so like appears uh, now we have validation from the React team itself. Uh, it achieves the same thing, but it's easier to to use it. Like you, you don't, you can call it dynamically. You don't need to call a function on a component before doing stuff. And when you actually implement things with render props, you have a bunch of details that you don't need to 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 be careful with. Like we have when we implement a render prop, we need to make sure that we are passing the props that were passed to, to the render prop. We need to make sure that we are uh, writing, like that we have properly handling a name for the component, that we are copying the static methods of the component. So it's, uh, we need a lot of attention to details when doing harder components that we don't need with render props. So this is a, a pattern that has gained a lot of traction. The only problem of render, render props, I believe it's, it's not highly composable. Uh, when you need to use information from two or three random props, you enter callback hell all over again. Uh, it feels like you are just like composing callbacks, which is what we escaped in JavaScript in the last <laughs> 10 years. So it's if you need to use it to, to reuse logic, just use your better judgment and choose from each. Yeah, I guess the only other thing that I'm seeing here is that um, and I may be wrong on this, but mm -hmm. it seems like you may be able to initialize it with the loading information. And then once you are actually able to fetch the data off the network and you get it back and you can validate it, 
you know, then you just update it and, and use the life cycle options that you have with components to do that as opposed to having, you know, if, if, else, if logic in the render. Uh, you mean with render props? Yeah, I'm still getting familiar with <laughs> some of these terms. So just in general... Um, yeah, but I think I think you you got it right. Like when you when you reuse uh, this uh, logic, you mm -hmm. are actually putting a lot of the life cycle dirty work in these right. render props or or uh, higher the components, right? So this is uh, this is another thing that you you want to you, you want to keep away of trying to do too much life cycle work. Right. You need to you, you want your components to be as clean as possible, as much view work as you can, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to to keep these things contained in simple in simple places. So because. Uh, Whenever I, whenever we write any application on, on these scenarios that I told you, like it's an application that's going to be around for years, going to be used by a lot of people, you always need to think about the future. You always need to think about, oh my God, it's two years from now, there's a bug, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and I need to debug this code that was written for me uh, that I wrote two years ago. Probably I'm more different than myself two years ago than I'm different to people around me. So this needs to be simple to understand. And if you have like life cycles everywhere, if you have fetch everywhere, if you have all these side effects everywhere, it's impossible to, to quickly find where the problem is. So, yeah, I guess that makes sense. It is keeping it simple and putting all the complexity in one place. Yes, right. Uh, it's uh, a lot of times it's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, I always like uh, like to refer to to this talk called "Simple Made Easy." Everybody should should listen to this talk. Probably, it's my desert yes desert island tech talk. <laughs> if I only <laughs> if I could only like watch one talk my my whole life, it would be this "Simple Made Easy" by Rich Hickey. So he talks about those things. It's like try to keep uh, things simple. Simple is different from easy. It, it's probably like decomposing components and making sure that you you keep like life cycles contained in in only one or two components. It's it will be really hard, but in the end the results will be simple. And like in two years, it will be much easier and safer to understand what's happening and the bug and things like that. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now, and it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. All right. Yeah, this is, this is exactly the, the, the link to the... Yeah, I yeah, put a link in the chat. Page. It'll show up in the show notes. Yes. Um, so where do you find that the trade-offs occur between these different approaches? I mean, you explain a lot of it in the blog post. Okay. But... Between, yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of times it feels like you're just, you know, you're kind of moving that if, else, if, else around. Yes, yes, because, yeah, the branching need, need to have to happen somewhere, right? So right. the uh, with rendered props, you actually use a function, right? Like mm -hmm. it's uh, the component calls a function with the desired data. So inside this function... You can do whatever logic, whatever branching logic uh, you want, and then call whatever uh, view component 
uh, you want to pass the information to. So with um, when you work with high order components, one big problem is that your component needs to understand exactly which prop is going to be passed by the higher the component that's going to use. So a uh, really common case, internationalization, like you use React INTL and uh, you need the INTL a prop to format your messages. So whenever I write any component that uses it, I need to, I need to, to put I, INTL prop into it and uh, then I need to mock it in my tests. Then I need to... Uh, I always need to take into account that inside my component. Uh, using a render prop, I could do the translations before putting the text into my 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 component, passing the text to, to the text uh, object to my component. So my my component doesn't need to understand how that text was produced. So I, I like the separation uh, that. Um, the props uh, gives me sometimes I have to write like a wrapper component just to understand the props that the higher the component uh, generated to translate it to the props that my component understands so this is a problem with higher order components I don't know if it's really clear it's really com uh, complicated to to explain those things in a in audio but yeah <laughs> I'll try my best here <laughs> Yeah, you're not the first person to bring that up too. That it's it's hard to explain over audio, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, but I believe yeah. Just open the the the, the blog post <laughs> together with the with the podcast. Probably it's going to be easier. So this is like uh, using one or the other. You need to you need to use your your better judgment. Sometimes it, you. You can even try if you are writing the hardware component or the render props. Most of the times, we're gonna use them in some in some uh, library that it it was chosen by the library we're using. As I said, most of the time, application code is container view. Mm -hmm. uh, the if we are going to write uh, reusable logic that are so generic and so reused that it's worth to to, to write render prop or something like that, then we can try. Write both, apply to two or three places. If it feels natural, if it feels good, if it feels simple, go for it. And the the other interesting point is, the other interesting question is, what if this reusable, yeah, I believe this is the way you, you, you deal with uh, harder components and rendered props. And I wonder if Corey has any other opinions on this too. No, I think that's good stuff. I've actually, um, we had a similar conversation uh, just a couple shows back uh, about the merits between the two. And um, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Kent that uh, the render props pattern is uh, preferable. And it seems like the community has largely decided that as well for most cases. Um, although that said, uh, I, I still um, am absolutely happy with using the higher order component for connect, for instance, those sorts of things the, the composition of multiple higher order components is more elegant than multiple render props. So I think both patterns continue to have their place. Um, and I, I guess the, the thing that's on my mind is a bit of a, a topic shift here is I'm curious if you've had time to kick the tires on the new context uh, feature. And I see you nodding. So um, tell me about your experience using context so far. Yeah, so this is a good uh, good segue to the next uh, big question in the blog post is, what happens when the side effects are very expensive, right? What happens when the reusable logic is like, I need to fetch something from, from an API. So if I put it on a render props and I use it five times in my page, am I going to fetch like five times the same API? Like it doesn't make any sense, right? So... We need to 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 do the expensive uh, side effects only once, and then uh, this data should be available to to whatever part of my application. So this is where context uh, enters, right? So usually uh, this pattern is called a provider pattern, 
uh, you put some, uh, you put a component, a provider component uh, high up on your React tree. It does the side effects for you. Let's say like fetch uh, user data from an API. And then it puts this information in, the, in React context. React context will be available for all for all the all the child components uh, even deeply, so you can gather this information back with uh, by accessing the, this context. Context up until the last version of, Re of React was a really weird API, and it had like a really like almost uh, felt like mystery because every time you see like someone from the react team blogging from it they were saying like don't use it it's going to change be careful so it was like a weird territory to to enter and it it had a, a really weird api so now in the new in the new react version they released a new api that is much cleaner much simpler uh, so you you have like providers for free you only put a value uh, prop inside a provider component. First of all, you create a context that uh, creates a provider and a consumer for you to, uh, to React components. You just uh, put a value prop in your provider. It will be available for all the consumers, and the consumer is a render prop you get the value that, that inside the provider. It made things uh, much easier. Uh, uh, it's so easy that I fear that a lot of people will use it without needing it. So we need to be really careful with uh, using the context because the context is actually like, just like putting uh, variables on global, we need to be really careful with that. As I said, like most of the time, 95, maybe even 98% of the times, we are passing props. We're just passing props. We don't need to put things in context and access them like really deep. But those 2% of the times that we need will make your application code much cleaner. So I'm really excited about the new context API. Uh, Lucas. Yeah. So Lucas, um, I think the most interesting conversation around context uh, revolves around contrasting it with Redux and uh, there's been some interesting blog posts that didn't surprise me. The moment that context came out, there was a really popular blog post talking about how uh, you could use context to replace Redux. And even uh, the author of that announced a library called React Waterfall, which gave some mm -hmm. Redux-like uh, sugar on top of context. And uh, as somebody who's teaching React a lot, I mean, literally just yesterday, I was um, over at a company and we were talking through Redux and I was showing them the new context API. And the funny thing was they're, they're using Redux uh, by default, which I find a lot of companies do. And when I say by default, I mean every single application that they publish, they begin day one with Redux there. And they, mm -hmm. and um, I can't tell you how often I end up talking to companies that have the frustration of, hey, we feel like we're uh, feeling a lot of pain just from the ceremony in Redux. And then I look at it and I realize, well, that's because you're using Redux in places um, that really local state would be preferable. So it's the overuse that creates the pain. Um, when you're, and I, I have that same concern about context, but I think the hard question right now is, since you have context here and has this really elegant API, it's easy to understand, it's very approachable, I think there's a, a risk for overuse there that is far greater than that that ever occurred with Redux. Um, and what I'm struggling with right now is, giving people good advice who are already familiar with Redux on when they might choose to use context in addition to Redux or in lieu of Redux. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have some thoughts in my head, but before I show my hand, do, what, what do you tell people right now and, or, or what is in, even in your head right now? If you were to build a, your next app in React, now that context is here, when do you feel like you would reach for it? Yeah, this is this is really interesting. So, first of all, I think uh, we are comparing like different levels of abstraction, right? I believe that Redux is, is higher level, a higher level of abstraction than context. Like Redux uh, always used context and probably will continue to use. And I, I believe they're already updated to to the new context. 
it gives you so even the even the the blog post uh, author like release a, a higher level of abstraction on top of context because I believe that using uh, using context alone for Redux work probably is going to be a little bit cumbersome because you ne- you still need to do some work like. How do I pass a function? Uh, how do I access a map dispatch to prop style functions in Redux? Like how do I how do I uh, mutate the information that is inside the context in my in my consumer? It's not that easy. Uh, we need to put the functions inside the state of the component that has the provider. It's it's not straightforward. So probably have something done for you is good. And another thing that I also like about Redux is, is the ecosystem. The, like the Redux uh, dev tools, they're really good. So whenever we, we choose to 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 go away from Redux, we need to put those things in our mind. Like we don't have the, the same ecosystem that we have for Redux in our playing context, and we still need to do a lot of things by hand. It's just like saying, oh, do you think that fetch, the new fetch API killed Axios library or any other like request a library? And it didn't, right? Like fetch is, is lower level. So I believe that it's it's a step in the right direction because I believe these these libraries will be all uh, will, will, be, will get simpler, uh, but I don't believe it will uh, it will kill libraries or anything like that. But for simple cases, as I said, if you only need like one simple side effect and then share it, one simple side effect on page load and share it. You don't need anything more than the provider. And I also feel that Redux were was overused in the last years. And I also have s- some opinions on that, but we can continue. No, that's a great answer. Uh, I think you hit on a lot of the ones that have been floating in my head. Uh, I think I think the, uh, yeah, the ergonomics of having uh, map state to props and map dispatch to props there that uh, allow me to easily get my hands on those uh, anywhere and not having to necessarily centralize everything wherever that provider is. Now, I have thought about that some too, and, and you recognize, okay, yeah, wherever I've got my provider, I'm going to be uh, declaring the state at that point and declaring any uh, functions at that point. But I also totally have the option to split my state down. I could pull it out to a separate JS file if it was a big chunk of state, and I could even merge those together. Um, if I've got a bunch of functions sitting there wherever I declare my provider, I can pull those out and make those pure functions. And you think about how you combine reducers today and Redux, I have that same sort of opportunity here. So I think uh, I, I really like what you said about Redux being a higher level abstraction than context. And you're absolutely right. Um, that's That's something that I think a lot of people didn't realize is uh, Redux and React Router are two great examples of uh, tools that all along have used context behind the scenes. And then for those that did realize it, it created a certain amount of confusion because they're going, well, wait, so you're saying the authors of these libraries are using context? Don't they know you're not supposed to use context? And the real thing was context, at least until recently, was for library authors because there was a buyer beware. The API was going to change. They knew that it wasn't their, their final word on the topic. And I agree with you. The new API is, is wonderful. It's uh, really intuitive, very elegant. So I think uh, what I'm interested in is uh, I have not yet had a chance to build a large-scale app um, that w- is, doesn't use Redux in, in a place where normally I would have reached for Redux just to see how much I can sort of solve the problem with my own decomposition with a few providers. And if, it, if that provider gets a little complicated, okay, separate it out to some separate pure functions and then compose it all together much the same way that, that Redux does. Um, I, I think I think your point about the, the ecosystem, though, is really relevant because, uh, you know, Redux got popular uh, very quickly. And that popularity has has given it a real foothold because there are so many other interesting things around it. I think about reselect and how easy it is to be able to memoize your selectors, that sort of a tool. I think about all the uh, mature middleware that you have there. Redux sagas make async um, quite elegant and declarative there. And not just that, but that you have so many different options in that space. I mean, 
that's that's pretty compelling. And the fact that you have a, a, an ability to create your own custom middleware, uh, that's mm-hmm. um, yeah. So th- there's a lot of pieces there that continue to make it compelling. But I also pay attention to uh, how long it took you and I to make that justification. It's a nuanced thing, and and developers are pretty. Uh, are, are appreciative of places where they can just go give me an answer and I'll run with it because we're all so busy and we're all trying to keep up. So I think some developers are just wanting to hear a yes, no. Is context a replacement for Redux? And my answer is no, very, very clearly no. And I think um, you know Dan Abramov, who created Redux, would say the same thing, although uh, you might think that he would say that because he's uh, biased. But I also respect Dan enough and had seen enough of his behavior that I trust that if he really felt that way, he would come out very publicly and say, Hey, I don't recommend using this thing I created anymore Mm -hmm. because this, this replaces it. I do know that, I mean, Dan had a goal when he joined the react team, he had a goal to come in and add some things to react that made it a better uh, development experience. And he recognized that by joining the team, he had more leverage to make that happen. So uh, I'm still interested to see what other pieces of Redux he might carve out and, and end up solving in a React first class way, especially when you talk about things like uh, hot reloading and time travel debugging. Those are some things that I think he's never been happy with how he had to get that done. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if some of those things come in the future. Um, but yeah, a great answer on, on the context side of things. Yeah, and I also uh, one thing that I, that I believe is is the the biggest uh, challenge of re, uh, Redux is uh, things like modern um, optimizations, like code splitting and lazy loading and things like that. It's it's really difficult to to do that in, in Redux. You know, it's a lot of like accidental complexity when you're writing an application. Uh, as I said, like in, the, in those types of projects that you're thinking about long term and stuff like that, and you are supporting a big business with the thing, usually, usually you want to like think about the business as much as you can. You want to build your product, right? You don't want to 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 lose uh, a lot of time uh, doing this optimization and stuff. And when we actually start needing that for the business, because like uh, performance, performance uh, from time to time is a business uh, need. Performance equals conversion, right? Uh, I I work in e-commerce, and now in Zocdoc, we see that uh, we see that all the time. And like, we need to lazy load uh, pieces of our code. We need to code split, and we are like reusing the same component here and there. So I'm trying to I'm trying to stay uh, away from from Redu- from Redux as much as I can in in even in B components. Try to, I try not to use to to, to be uh, far from the Redux pattern. Like it's good to to think about like actions and then think about what your actions, how they influence on your state management and having these thoughts on separated places. Uh, but I believe I, I did not uh, experiment with that yet. But I believe that maybe the new context and having things inside uh inside uh react itself maybe will turn things like code splitting and this more advanced techniques of the present easier to work than with redux that's a well, actually um I, i'm a little unclear when you say uh, code splitting is harder with redux um, in, in what ways does redux make it harder because i'm thinking about when you say code splitting i'm thinking about for instance, I want to lazy load components. Redux doesn't slow that down in any way if I'm talking about the presentation components, for instance. Those are leaf nodes. They're plain old React components. Are you saying uh, lazy loading in terms of the containers is more yes. difficult? Yes, like la- lazy loading uh, reducers, for instance, and things like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Lazy I've never tried the whole to... logic. Yeah, I've never tried to lazy load uh, reducers before. Yeah, um, there are a couple. Yeah, there are a couple of, of libraries that try to achieve that, but it's like it's it's the fact that there's like some libraries and they're not that like uh, mainstream yet and things like that show that it's not an easy. It's not an easy. Like Redux is simple. It it get it's not that simple anymore when you try to lazy load more things. Like what if I want to like change only. 
uh, here in ZocDoc, we have like times grid. It's a relatively complicated uh, component. And what if I want to, to lay slow the whole times grid, including like all the logic, all the reducers, all the action creators? Not that uh, it's not that uh, trivial. So this is, uh, this is something that, that I'm looking forward. The, the interesting thing is um, Reason ML. I don't know if you played with Reason ML, the, the uh, Ocamo flavor being built by the React. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Reason ML is fascinating. Uh, yeah, it's really. really. Yeah, I, I love playing with like strong type things. It, it, it I always feels smarter and more intelligent after I. <laughs> you, you do because I. I feel dumber, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, during I feel dumber, yeah, but after <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, I think that the the wrapper that they have on React, the reason React wrapper, it's um, it's really interesting the way they approach that because they are not using Redux, but in a way, but on another way, they embraced fully the Redux pattern. So like whenever you have state handling in any component, you have to, you have to write a reducer. So you have to work in the, in the Redux way for like every small component that you have, but you can uh, lazy load them, you can compose them just like normal React components. And I feel that that is like a much better, a, a, much, a very interesting pattern to, to work with. So you still have the, the, the simplicity of Redux of like I have actions, right? And I have a reducer that take an action, my previous state and brings a new state. They even have uh, some Elm inspired like side of, a way of handling side effect inside the React component that I really like it. So I believe that the re reason React way of doing things is is joining the, the best of both both worlds. So uh, yeah, and going back to JavaScript, I don't I don't think re Redux, even though I'm trying to use less and less and less, I don't think it's it's going anywhere soon. As soon as we need to have global data and change this global data according to uh, user interactions and stuff, it's still the the the, the, the simple way of doing things. So the, your description of ReasonML, yeah, um, I, I think it's interesting that ReasonML is taking a lot of the lessons that we learned in the React space and then making them canonical and effectively paving a very clear path for people. Uh, and, and also, my understanding is uh, ReasonML is made by Jordan Walk, who was the original creator of React, right? So he's effectively seeing his opportunity to take lessons learned and go a step farther um, in a strongly typed space, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty compelling. Now, the thing I'm looking for is people actually using ReasonML, and I think that the hard part is right now, uh, React is so good and so easy to learn and so ubiquitous now that it is becoming rather difficult for other good ideas to replace it. Uh, just at least at the moment. Now, given if you had said you could have said the exact same thing about Angular not that long ago. Um, but at the moment, React is just wildly popular. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, like, what you, everything you just said about Reason ML, I would have been saying about Elm just about two years ago. I'd say. I mean, I was really excited about Elm when I uh, first saw it too. And I don't know if I have my timeline right, but it feels like it was about two years ago that I um, I was really amped about it. But again, it's one of those things that doesn't seem to have caught fire because. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it may just be the problem of always bet on JavaScript. I, I'm still not sure that we're going to see something catch fire to the level of Angular and React that is not embracing plain JavaScript. That's the big question. Because I think about, you know, TypeScript has gotten a lot, lot of uh, inertia and done quite well. Uh, and, and really, Elm has done quite well, too. Uh, but where... <laughs> We've yet to see a clear market leader that is using something other than JavaScript. Yeah, I agree. This is uh, this is one of the the hardest uh, the hardest questions to, to, questions to answer. Like, what what's going to happen, right? So, uh, the Rich Hickey 
video that that I that I that I, we talked about earlier. So after that video, I started looking at closure. Right, this guy invented a language, so I'm I'm gonna look at it, and it's a really interesting uh, language. And they have closure script, which uh, compiles beautifully to JavaScript too. And they have like some really nice React wrappers and stuff. And it's like, oh my god, this is so good. I, I wish I I, I only used it. And then after that, I started like looking at a bunch of other like compiled to, to JavaScript languages. I like to do that because it seems that, that the future is there. Whenever something interesting in JavaScript world happens, you can look for like it was probably done one year before in one of those, uh, <laughs> yeah. one of those places. It's, it's really interesting. But actually, like it was done before, but they don't get as, as popular as JavaScript. I, I have a couple of hypotheses. One of them is uh, probably like the same f- uh, with Redux. It's like ecosystem. Ecosystem, like the, the way you can debug things in a browser today, it's crazy. So whenever you leave JavaScript, it's a little bit more difficult. The amount of libraries you have for everything on NPM, it's crazy. But as soon as you leave JavaScript, oh, uh, FFI is, is becoming easier and easier. Uh, it's Super easy to in, to integrate your code with uh, ReasonML or whatever language code. It's almost never that easy. So uh, this, I, I I believe the ecosystem is like super strong. So uh, I it's difficult. I think the ReasonML is the the language that is. It's trying to get closer to what people are actually doing on JS and React. So maybe maybe this is the one, but I would never bet on anything <laughs> like that. As I said, like I would never bet against JavaScript. And come on, things are getting like really cool in JavaScript world too. Oh yeah. I also look at whatever I pick up, I'm thinking about will this help enable me uh, to move to whatever's new in the future? Sure, and JavaScript is such a safe bet. Chances are me getting really good at JavaScript to do React is going to help me be really successful elsewhere later. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, summarizing the patterns from the blog post, if you want, this, uh, it's like only three small, three small uh, points. First of all, use container, the container view pattern. Separate logic and side effects from your views and do this for 95% of your code. Try to do this whatever and wherever. And and it's like, this is the queen of all patterns. Try to use it. If you really need to reuse logic, use either a render props or a higher order component. If this logic that you are going to share among different components is very expensive, write a provider or use Redux or any other uh, library to use providers and then make it available to the rest of your code. This three, thinking in these three uh, big bullet points will get you like really, really far in a React project. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming and talking through this with us. Let's go ahead and jump in for some picks. Corey, do you have some picks for us? For you, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Uh, yes, I do. I've got a couple of picks. Uh, one thing is I am speaking at a Fluent Conference in San Jose, California, coming up in June, and they still have, uh, I think, early bird tickets available, if I remember right, for just a little while longer, depending on when this show actually publishes. Uh, nonetheless, awesome conference for front-end devs, lots of good sessions on React. So 
um, and love to catch up with people listening there. So that's one pick. Other pick is uh, there are many different ways to handle immutable data in React. And uh, just recently, I tried out Emmer at the suggestion of uh, Dan Abramov and Eric Elliott, two people that pointed out to me on Twitter. And uh, wow, Emmer is really nice. This is actually created a uh, library created by the uh, author of MobX. And it gives you a really simple way to handle immutable data by uh, effectively telling it in a declarative way what you want to change. And then behind the scenes, it handles that uh, declaration in an immutable manner. So very elegant. Uh, and if you're wondering, Emmer is German for always. So it's a nice little way to remember why he called it that. Uh, so those are my two picks. Nice. I'm going to jump in with a few picks. So one thing that I've been playing with, um, and I'm trying to get it to work. Um, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, I guess, because I've been playing with it for uh, a couple hours. But um, I found a, a company called Full Contact, fullcontact.com. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, so I use a pipe drive to keep track of um, sort of the pipeline of inviting people to the shows and uh, sponsorship and all that stuff. So, you know, they kind of go into the lead bucket and then they move along. Um, so, you know, Lucas has gone through that process. He just didn't know it. A bunch of other people did too. Um, but one problem that I've had is sharing all of my contact information or all the contact information that I have for people over the years doing all these shows with Michelle, who's the person who does the scheduling. And so I found this program called Full Contact and you can set up a team account and then you're able to share uh, contacts that way. And so I just hooked up my uh, Google contacts and off it went and pulled in a whole bunch of people's information and I can now hand that off to her. And that way she can reach out to somebody if we want to get them back on the show, which is really convenient. Um, it also does business card imports and that's the part that I've been playing with for the last little while. I keep hoping that, uh, so I uploaded a bunch of business card photos, but I haven't, I haven't seen the contact info go in yet. So I'm kind of hoping that that happens sooner rather than later, but it'd be really nice for uh, conferences because I wind up with a pile of business cards and then I'm trying to get home with them and then remember to check in with all those folks. And so if I could just, you know, put them into a system and then have some kind of automation that sticks it into pipe drive for me. So it's, Hey, follow up with this person you met at this event. That would be really convenient. So anyway, um, so I'm going to go ahead and pick that. And then um, I've also been going through a course on Udemy. And so I'm going to pick Udemy and I'm going to pick the course. And the course is Ethereum and blockchain. And uh, that has been super fun. And they do the code in um, whatever the language is for writing smart contracts. So something, I don't remember. And then they also go through the solidity. That's what it is. And then they also go through writing a lot of this stuff in JavaScript and you test it in JavaScript in the course using Node.js and Mocha. So that's been really awesome too. I'm really enjoying that. I'm speaking on that at uh, Ruby Hack next week. And so I'm going to be tying it into Ruby instead of JavaScript, but um, cool stuff. And um, yeah, if you're going to Fluent, um, there is about a 50-50 chance that I'll be there as well. So um, I have a media ticket. I'm just looking for a sponsor to pay my way. Um, and then I'll do some interviews with people there and stuff like that. So um, that, that's how they get their bit out of it is that I put YouTube videos up and mention them in the video. So anyway, um, so yeah. So if you're going out to Fluent, let me know. Let Corey know. And that way we can all say hi to each other. Um, Lucas, what are your picks? Yeah, my first pick is uh, per CIO. We use this. Uh, uh, we use their services uh, here at Zocdoc. Uh, you write uh, screenshot tests with them, and like every PR, we're hooked to 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 Percy. We have a GitHub integration with them, so uh, it tests our components and it shows like the difference by pixel. So you can visually wow. see everything that is changing from one PR to the other. 
So this is, I think this raised the quality uh, like of our product like tremendously. So I recommend, I, it's one of those things that like, my God, how can we <laughs> live without it? So I really recommend people uh, looking at Percy. And of course, like always, always uh, be studying and be looking at new languages and new paradigms. I always look at these crazy functional languages out there and what they're doing. There is the future of front end. Look those places. Look on ReasonML today, and look on like Fable, which is F sharp that compiles to JavaScript. Look at ClojureScript, and be inspired. That's it. All right. Well, if people want to see what you're working on these days, um, it looks like you've got a blog, but do you also have a Twitter account or GitHub account or anywhere else that people can see what you're thinking about? Yeah, uh, my Twitter account is uh, at I am Lucas Reese. Uh, I am on if you if you fortunately after <laughs> this blog post being <laughs> becoming popular, if you Google simple React patterns, it's usually there, like top uh, three or or something like that on Google. So. I believe that today is the, the, the easiest <laughs> way to find the blog and find me and reach out. Let's, uh, let's talk. I love to talk to, to everybody about new ideas and stuff. I work here at ZocDoc. So if you have any questions about my work here and about my previous work, and if you want to talk about how is it to live as a musician for 10 years in a Latin America country, <laughs> please. All right. Sounds good. We'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks for coming, Lucas. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It's a really good podcast. It was really good talking to you, talk to Corey. Uh, peace, everyone. Peace. All right, we'll See catch ya. you later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly.